My name is Solly Angel. I'm a senior research scholar and adjunct professor of urban planning at the NYU Stern Urbanization Project. The title of my lecture today is Making Room for a Planet of Cities. Making room, the idea behind it is that we need to open up uh, land for cities to expand into. This stands in direct contrast with the containment paradigm that has been most popular among planners, policymakers, and environmentalists over the last two or three decades. That containment paradigm suggests that cities need to be contained, that need to be, uh, that we need to control development so that they don't expand too much or too fast. Uh, that containment paradigm worries me uh, because uh, some of these cities are expanding too rapidly to be contained. And if they are contained, there are quite adverse consequences. An example of that is Seoul that had a green belt around it that was put in in the early 70s. Seoul grew extremely rapidly, and by the late 80s, it filled in the area within the green belt with the result that housing prices shot up and became completely unaffordable. Now, I worry about affordable housing for the millions and millions of people who are going to come to cities in rapidly urbanizing countries. And I think that containing uh, uh, these cities uh, compromises that uh, goal. An example of a city uh, that did very well in terms of affordable housing is Bangkok. Bangkok allowed for expansion. It sits in the rice bowl and has no boundaries for it, no limitations for its uh, growth. It grew very rapidly in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, the housing there was extremely affordable. In the mid-80s, for example, you could get a land and house package in Bangkok for $6,000. Uh, this is extremely affordable. It was affordable by one-third of the slum population of Bangkok at that time. But uh, laissez-faire development, Bangkok style, also has its costs. Uh, Bangkok has developed uh, very rapidly without any concern about public works. Uh, for example, it does not have arterial roads. Uh, in some places uh, in, uh, in the city, there are arterial roads that are eight kilometers apart. And inside, it's very disorganized development, with a result that uh, traffic cannot go through these areas. It all crowds on arterial roads, and Bangkok is one of the most congested cities in the world. It also doesn't have any trunk infrastructure in these areas. It doesn't have a water supply system. It doesn't have a drainage system. It doesn't have a sewer system, with a result that uh, people are pumping water, and the city is sinking, it, and uh, there's no drainage, so the city is flooding. Uh, Bangkok is a true infrastructure disaster. So uh, we have to think about this kind of basic infrastructure schemes that have to go in before development takes uh, place. Uh, when we put in streets uh, before development uh, takes place, it is a lot more efficient. If, for example, we allow development like the favelas in Rio de Janeiro and then try to put streets after uh, development has taken place, they cost between three and nine times what they cost when we lay out streets before uh, the occupation of the area. Now, that street layout is a universal idea, and it sometimes happens even in squatter invasions. Uh, Lima, for example, expanded into the, uh, the count, uh, countryside with uh, squatter invasions that were planned. Uh, they were planned in a street grid uh, with 10 meter wide streets and 200 meter squatter plots. Uh, with a result that 30 years later, this is a kind of a bustling neighborhood where houses uh, cost up to $40,000 in the 150 square meter living area uh, on a 200 meter square uh, squatter plot. So this is a lot more efficient. So we need to think about the preparation of the land for public works and public spaces before development takes place. Another important lesson that uh, we've learned. The same lesson also applies to public open spaces. Uh, you look at Sao Paulo, 15 square, 100 square kilometers of, uh, uh, of development with no open space at all. 
they remembered to put in some open spaces, but they are all at the periphery. The city itself is completely and fully built. So we need to incorporate these lessons into a new paradigm uh, for developing uh, kind of minimal planning intervention in uh, uh, cities in rapidly urbanizing countries, cities that don't have uh, very good uh, planning regimes, that don't have very good uh, uh, capacity for planning uh, at a very detailed level. We need some basic ideas about how to do that. These basic ideas are incorporated into what I call the making room paradigm. The first thing we need to consider is how much land will city need to accommodate this uh, urban population growth. What we need to understand, and this is something we realized only recently, is that city areas grow faster than city populations. We take the example of Accra, the capital of Ghana. Between 1985 and 2000, the population grows by 50%. The area grows by 150%, three times as fast. More generally, uh, the area of cities grows faster than their population because densities decline. And densities have been in decline for 100 years or more. If we look at the long-term decline of densities in Paris, for example, it, it gives a very interesting picture. Paris in 1800, during the time of Napoleon, is 11 square kilometers, half a million people. Paris in 2000 is 10 million people, 2,000 square kilometers. The population grows up by 20, the area goes up by 200. And th that is decline in density between 500 people per hectare to 50 people per hectare over that 200 year period. When we look at density decline in the US, for example, for 20 cities that we've looked at, between 1910 and 2010, densities decline fivefold. And they decline not only uh, in the periphery, they also decline in the center. Densities in Manhattan, for example, uh, the densest part of New York City go down by a half at least between 1910 and uh, uh, 2010. We see long-term density decline in 30 cities that we've studied uh, for uh, 200 years, and in 120 cities that we've studied for 10 years, we see a 2% per year density decline in all regions. So densities decline in the US, they decline in Europe, in Japan, and they also decline in all developing countries. That means that uh, cities in the developing countries will expand, not only because of population growth, but also because of the decline in density. Let us think for a moment about the amount of land that we will need for urban expansion in coming decades. Now, the amount of land will be determined pretty much by population growth, but it will also be determined by density decline. And we've made three assumptions about density decline. First, the density will stay the same. Second, that it will decline by 1% per year, which is roughly the rate of decline of Paris over the last 200 years, or that it will decline by 2% per year, which is the average rate of decline of 120 cities uh, in our sample between 1990 and uh, 2000. And then we can start to calculate how much land we will need in every region to accommodate urban expansion. In the developing countries as a whole, uh, if densities do not change, uh, the amount of land that we need for urban expansion between now and 2050 will triple. If densities go down by 1%, it will go up five times. If they go down by 2%, it'll go up seven times. So that is the kind of Serda level of expansion that we have to think about, that there will be cities that will be growing by three, four, five, six, and seven times between now and 2050, and that is what uh, we need to prepare for. Now, in uh, Latin America, it's going to be a bit lower than average. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's going to be higher than average. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, just by population growth between now, 2010, 2050, it will the land required for cities will quadruple at a 1%, it will go up seven times, at 2%, it'll go up 12 times. And these numbers are the numbers that we're working with, for example, in Ethiopia, where we are guiding an urban expansion initiative. I'll talk about this uh, in a minute. Uh, 
there are four steps that we need to think about when we're preparing cities for their expansion. First, that they need adequate land supply. And to do that, they have to calculate properly, just as I've explained before, how much expansion will be due to population growth, how much will be due to density decline, and have some fairly sensible evidence about how much land they're going to need for their expansion. The good example here is New York City that in 1811 prepared an expansion plan, the famous commissioner's plan for New York that expanded the area of the city uh, sevenfold uh, in 1811. That area was uh, filled up by 1900. It had another expansion plan. It uh, expanded into the four counties adjacent to it, uh, the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn and Staten Island, and it created the street plan in 1900 for the expansion into the entire area, and that area was filled up in 35 years. So New York gives you an example of the kind of uh, amount of expansion that is needed. A recent example is Mumbai that has a great expansion plan, uh, uh, the 2011 regional plan for Mumbai. Uh, unfortunately, what is holding Mumbai from expanding and from decongesting its center is the lack of infrastructure. So uh, they've been very slow creating the kind of bridges and the kind of highways and the kind of railroads that are necessary in order to move away from the peninsula in which Mumbai is located towards the periphery where there's a lot of land for expansion. The second thing we need to think about is generous city limits. We need to, uh, we cannot create a plan for expansion when there are all kinds of municipalities that have jurisdiction over different pieces of land. We need general city limits. Uh, the best example for that, of course, are the Chinese cities. I mean, uh, Beijing in 1999 had an administrative area that was 11 times larger than its built up area. That is way too large, but at least we have to have uh, general city limits that will allow us to make minimum plants there. And what do I mean by minimum plants? Only two things. We have to create a grid of arterial roads that will carry public transport and major trunk infrastructure in the entire expansion area. And what we mean by an arterial grid is a one kilometer uh, grid of roads that are maybe 25 or 30 meter wide that uh, all we need to do now is get the rights of way for these roads. We don't need to build the roads, but we need to get the land for the roads. That's the secret. And that what needs to be done now before development takes place. And uh, there are examples of where this has been created. One, exam one very good example is Ahmedabad, which is uh, shown here. This arterial grid is a fairly uh, common occurrence, for example, in the US. The uh, plan created by Jefferson uh, to grid the entire United States west of the Ohio River with a one-mile grid. You can see it in Detroit. It's a very clear uh, one-mile grid. One mile is a bit too wide because it, uh, it's too far for people to walk to a public transport station. This is why the grids that we're planning on one, uh, one uh, uh, kilometer rather than one mile. Uh, in Toronto, for example, there's an excellent grid that carries public transport and so what you see when you look at the map of Toronto looks like a street grid, but it's actually the transit plan. There are buses going across each one of these uh, streets, uh, both north, south, and east, west. So you can get to pretty much any place in Toronto by taking uh, two buses, and they are now programmed to arrive uh, at the right time, so you don't waste time waiting at the station. We have two. Uh, urban expansion initiatives now, uh, one in Ethiopia and one in Colombia. In Ethiopia, we have four cities that are preparing plans for their expansion. You can see one of these uh, uh, municipal teams uh, preparing their arterial uh, grid plan, the Bahir Dar uh, municipal team. There are other teams that are ahead of Bahir Dar in Mekele, in Adama, in Hawassa. A similar uh, initiative is being planned in Colombia, where we have uh, five cities uh, Valle du Par, Monteria, Tunja, Yopal, and Santa Marta that are preparing expansion plans. These expansion plans have these grids, and uh, uh, they are now measuring the grids, calculating how much compensation will need to be paid to landowners, and actually putting markers on the ground to ensure that the land for this grid is there. Street plans, uh, er, 
Town development schemes can be developed uh, later, but the grid is there to ensure that the city is developed in an orderly fashion, that there's room for the public transport system, for the trunk infrastructure, and that all development takes place within the planned system of this, uh, uh, or, uh, for this expansion. Finally, the fourth element of uh, preparing for expansion is ensuring that their public open spaces are protected. As we saw before, when you have just laissez faire development without thinking ahead about open space, there is no open space. So the idea is to secure and protect some critical open spaces that you need uh, from development by, by formals or informals so that uh, we have a hierarchy of open spaces when the city gradually moves into these areas. Again, Toronto is a great example. 11% uh, of the area of Toronto is in a hierarchy of o protected open spaces along the rivers, along the, co uh, along the, uh, the lake, uh, in different places. They are large and small. So uh, to summarize, this making room paradigm has got simply four elements, uh, making correct estimates of how much land we're going to need for development, creating generous metropolitan boundaries where we can plan for this development, putting together the rights of way for an arterial grid throughout the expansion area, and finally securing a system, a hierarchy of open spaces. This is all that is necessary to make room for urban expansion, and this is what we think is a fruitful and productive agenda for cities in rapidly uh, urbanizing countries to pursue. Thank you.